Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Catherine Ott. I'm the Legislative Director for Homeland Security and Public Safety at the National Governors Association. I want to welcome everybody from our Hill friends to our association friends and federal, federal family friends who have joined us today for this briefing on state actions and policing reform. We're splitting it between both gubernatorial actions as well as state legislative actions. Um, so I want to thank our partnership here today with the National Conference of State Legislatures and the National Criminal Justice Association who are joining joining us today to partner for this briefing. So we have two parts today. We're going to give kind of an overview of the broad themes at the state level um, from NGA as well as NCSL. And then the second half of this briefing today, we will hear from members of the legislature in Cal Colorado, as well as members of the governor's office in uh, Ohio. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce my colleague, uh, Jeff Locke, who is the um, Program Director for Public Safety and Legal Counsel at the NGA Center for Best Practice Practices, and Nicole Bannister, who is a policy analyst over in our Center for Best Practices as well. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you to get us get started. Great. Uh, thank you, MC. <clears throat> and I, I should note that NGA not only supports all 55 state and territorial governors, but also supports their general counsel, criminal justice advisors, and cabinet officials around all things public safety. Uh, so we're not only a resource to governors and their staff, but uh, with events like today, we also wanna be a resource to you all uh, on the Hill as well on justice issues. So just five brief points from me, and then I'll turn it to Nicole here, um, on what we're hearing from governor's offices on law enforcement and racial equity work uh, over the last uh, year or so. First, that this is, this is part of a larger criminal justice reform conversation that has been going on a long, long time, uh, which states have led on for years and longer term justice reform has taken up a number of different issues uh, from pretrial to inside the walls to reentry, just, just to highlight a few. Um, and then second, this conversation on policing reform has a larger behavioral health angle as well, which needs representation and additional perspectives into this conversation. And, and third, by and large, you know, we've heard from many states that they see the same range of issues uh, that, that are important to them uh, at the state level. And as laboratories of democracy, states are in the process of figuring out how to make this take root uh, with a suite of seven or eight key policies uh, that many states are taking on in one or more ways that Nicole will, will talk about in a moment. Um, fourth, you know, an acknowledgement that, you know, no state has gotten this fully right yet or is fully satisfied and that these reforms are new and each of these states are taking it on piecemeal or unique approaches to see what works in their respective jurisdiction, uh, which makes sense as, as, you know, you have urban and rural ju jurisdictional needs that are different and police reforms may look different in those spaces, uh, given, for example, that many rural entities are, are small in nature. And, and therefore, flexibility is going to be needed with such structures. Uh, given that these reforms are nascent, um, perhaps imposing a, a more rigid bureaucratic structural structure will be problematic on top of it moving forward. And my last point, um, you know, enhanced relationships, I think, are going to be key and essential between states, uh, between Congress, uh, your bosses, and, and you as staff, and the, and the administration. So we've heard from governor's offices that we need a holistic approach and states are acting as innovators to, you know, and acting quickly in this space over the last year. So we want to support that with flexibility, flexibility and patience and thoughtful collaboration. So I'll turn it over to Nicole here to go over some of the brief themes that we've seen over the last year from governor's offices. Nicole. Thanks, Jeff. And um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm just going to highlight a few uh, themes and topics that we've seen from governors and state leaders um, who have been convening discussions on and taking actions on over the last year around law enforcement and policing. So um, just to note, um, over the past year, we've seen at least 15 governors convene formal commissions, task forces, or working groups, um, and at least 35 governors have addressed and or taken some action um, or step towards improving law enforcement and policing policies in their states. Um, many of these discussions and efforts, you know, really began prior to the last year, um, but are a key part of the, the broader conversation um, in states around examining, evaluating, and improving the criminal justice system. Um, so governors and their state executive agencies in particular play a critical role in public safety in their states, both through the state police, um, as well as shaping policies and practices at the local level. Um, state agencies often have entities that work with or convene um, and coordinate with local law enforcement agencies. And we've seen uh, more increasingly state entities taking on a more proactive role in setting statewide standards um, and recommended practices for local law enforcement agencies um, and supporting agencies and implementation of those standards. Um, so just with that brief background, I just wanted to highlight 
The six main themes that we've been seeing um, in these state discussions and efforts, uh, the first being uh, improving oversight and accountability. Uh, we've seen a number of states revising policies and providing independent mechanisms to investigate complaints, hold officers accountable for misconduct, and remove legal barriers to accountability. Um, this has also included amending qualified immunity statutes and empowering civilian oversight boards. Um, I know we're going to hear um, from two great states on the line today, but just I'll just note a few other states that we've seen action in some of these areas as well. Um, we've seen some states develop mechanisms for independent investigations of excessive force, such as Governor Inslee in Washington, um, as well as Virginia, empowering localities to create civilian law enforcement review boards. Um, the second main theme is enhancing personnel requirements. This includes training, certification, hiring, and credentialing. Uh, we've seen more of a movement towards certification and licensing, which is more akin to other professions, you know, strengthening the authority of standards and training boards, developing processes for the collection and sharing of decertification data, um, and increased requirements for training. Um, we've seen a large number of states take action in this area. Um, probably the largest out of all the, the main themes we've seen. Um, this would include Arkansas requiring agencies to report disciplinary actions and Oregon creating a statewide database for officer decertification. The third main theme is amending policing tactics and practices. Uh, we've seen states develop specific use of force policies uh, and prohibit certain tactics such as chokeholds and review standards and policies around uh, protest policing, um, as well as mandating or expanding the use of body cameras. Um, we've seen a number of states engage in this area, including Connecticut, Tennessee, and Utah, um, addressing changes to the use of force policies and setting statewide standards for police use of force, as well as supporting implementation at the local level. Um, we've also seen states requiring the use of body-worn cameras, such as New Mexico and Illinois. The fourth main theme is fostering community engagement and building public trust. Governors and state leaders have also crafted strategies to improve law enforcement community interaction through increased engagement, transparency, and implementation of community policing initiatives. Um, I'll just note Michigan and Pennsylvania's work in this area uh, where they created the State Law Enforcement Citizen Advisory Commission. Um, the fifth main theme is building partnerships and initiatives across, across systems with, within broader strategic planning efforts. Um, a number of states are engaged in a variety of cross-disciplinary and strategic partnerships that are related to um, or overlap with their policing efforts. For example, a number of states are considering and exploring structures and initiatives to advance behavioral health and public safety partnerships um, in order to appropriately respond to the needs of communities. Uh, these discussions have also included um, uh, the recently passed uh, federal legislation on the 988 mental health crisis hotline. Um, and lastly, for the last theme, I'll just note, um, there's really been a broader conversation around um, race equity and inclusion within states, um, as states are grappling on how to address racial disparities across various systems, uh, including criminal justice, but also education, health, housing, economic systems. Um, so governors and state leaders have also been engaging in these efforts um, and connecting them to the uh, conversations around law enforcement and policing. And I'll just note, um, Kansas Governor Kelly um, established a commission on racial equity and justice, which initially focused on recommendations for law enforcement reform, but is also taking a broader look at issues of racial justice within education, economic opportunity, and healthcare. Um, so with that, I'm happy to talk any more about what seats are doing um, during Q&A if, if, if folks have questions, but I'll turn it back to MC. Great, thanks all. Uh, and I just dropped in the chat for everybody the great memo that my colleagues uh, have put together on all the actions across the states for folks uh, to take a look at, as I know a lot of great information was put forward from Nicole and Jeff's briefing. So thanks. We'll go ahead now, um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague at the National Conference of State Legislature, Susan Frederick, um, to introduce herself. Uh, she's a Senior Federal Affairs Counsel for NCSL. So Susan, uh, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, MC. I'm going to share my screen here briefly. So you are, we have a couple of slides to run through here. Give me just a second. Okay. So first of all, I wanted to um, just put out a couple of points that we find important at NCSL. We have two offices, our Denver, Colorado offices, our state research branch, or main office, and then our DC offices are our advocacy and federal affairs shop. So I work in the federal affairs part of NCSL. So what I wanna to talk to you about for a few moments are some of the things that we uh, are looking at with respect to criminal justice reform and policing issues specifically. So some of our main concerns or issues that we raise pretty much with any federal legislation that moves. We, we don't want to see unfunded mandates or cost shifts to states. We know that 
Uh, both CRS and CBO have put out uh, reports on the Justice and Policing Act coming out of the House. We know that there are costs that may be uh, prohibitive to states to actually implement in any meaningful way. So we would urge members of Congress and others involved in this particular piece of legislation to take a close look at what those costs would mean for states and whether they're uh, actually able to be implemented because of those costs. And most of those costs have been labeled around the reporting requirements coming from the states to uh, the Department of Justice on policing misconduct issues. So those databases are expensive. We need to know how that's gonna get paid for at the state level going up to the feds. The other consideration that we always like to put out there that in recent years has become kind of a problem for us is we are seeing a lot of federal legislation that uses penalty language, particularly in burn jag, and now we're seeing it in COPS as well for non-compliance. This is not an incentive. Taking away criminal justice funding that states and localities use to implement the very things Congress would like to see done at the state and local level is counterproductive and actually counterintuitive at best. Um, at worst, it causes states to do a cost benefit analysis, which we saw with the Adam Walsh Act and SORNA, where states have determined that the cost to implement is, is not outweighed by the cost of non-compliance. So they just don't comply. And we don't wanna see that. We wanna see states you know, provide the protections that are necessary and do the right thing. But if they can't afford to do it, then it becomes a, a fiscal issue that they oftentimes can't surmount or overcome. And the third thing I wanna raise with everyone is the idea of consultation and collaboration. One of the things that we value at, at the state level, and I know my members do, who are state legislators and legislative staff from around the country, is the opportunity to partner with the federal government when considering massive pieces of legislation such as the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and other large pieces of criminal justice reform. And the reason I say this is not so that states can get away with anything or do, you know, not do what they're supposed to do. It's because particularly in this area of policing, and you'll hear from my colleague Amber in just a moment, states have already moved the yardstick kind of way down the road in many areas of this issue. And so we don't want to see federal legislation coming in and undoing the good works and the good things that states have done. Um, having to go back to the drawing board and kind of redo their, their operating premise. We wanna see collaboration and cooperation where the federal government, Congress, the administration and state policymakers come together to work on what might be seen as best practices or things that can be done that don't um, harm or undo good works that states have already put into motion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Amber Widgery, who works in our Denver, Colorado office. And she is an amazing person who has been working on our legislative databases for policing issues. And I'm gonna have her tell you a little bit about what we're seeing in the States uh, over the last year or so. Thanks so much, Susan. If you'll just pop to that next slide. I do wanna just highlight a couple of those databases that I, can, I think can be real resources for you. Um, as you continue working on this issue. The first you see here is NCSL's new statutory policy database. And you can think about this as that sort of yardstick that Susan mentioned. This is a snapshot or a state of the states um, roughly at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 before legislation really took off in 2021. And so this gives you an idea of um, areas of policy where states already have robust actions um, and have taken you know, some substantial steps already. And then the second link that I dropped into the chat, and Susan, if you'll go to that next slide, is our second database. And that database is our legislation tracker. So bills that you see here are getting updated every single night. You'll see new status updates every single night. We're adding legislation as it's introduced and identified by NCSL staff, which usually means that we're adding legislation about weekly at this point. Um, some of the introductions are starting to slow down and we're starting to get more information sort of about how the 2021 sessions are wrapping out. And so that's what I want to briefly cover on the next slide, Susan, is some of the initial numbers of what we've seen. So policing has very quickly moved to the top of legislative agendas in a number of states. 
We've seen more than 3,000 bill introductions from May of 2020 until May of 2021. Um, which is fairly significant. And in the second half of 2020, we saw 93 enactments, which is also really notable because those enactments came from just over half of the states. We had 26 states with new laws in 2020. And that's notable because most of the states that took action would not normally have been in session during that time frame in 2020. They were coming back into special session to address these issues or they were in special session related to COVID-19 budgetary matters and also took up this issue as well. So the action that we saw in 2020 was really sort of um, starting to pick up this issue and we saw states also putting together task forces. Some of that was mentioned by my NGA colleagues, um, putting together planning for 2021 sessions. So far in 2021, just over half the states have 131 new enactments. Um, but this is sort of the beginning, and we still have 1,700 bills pending and about 50 that are waiting for executive action still. And I just want to say a quick note, I provide these numbers for a broad context, but the numbers certainly aren't indicative of um, you know, the sweeping actions in the state or not. Uh, just to give an example of that, states like Illinois have a single enactment, but it's really notable that House Bill 3653 is more than 750 pages long, and it's really a very comprehensive piece of legislation. We've seen really comprehensive approaches in a couple of other states. I'll just list a few notable examples. Uh, Colorado, Connecticut, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, Oklahoma, Utah, and Virginia are all states that have had either really comprehensive single bills or really comprehensive packages of legislation. And all of those can be found in our legislation database. Um, and you can sort of review where the states have been moving in 2021. Uh, Susan, if you'll go to the next slide. So some of this is gonna be a lot of what you heard from Nicole earlier, but the top of the line for what states are really focusing on is accountability. Um, that means measures related to accountability and directly use of force, but it also means changes to um, employment and labor policies at the state level as they impact uh, police and also a handful of other issues. I noted a lot of the sub issues here on the slides so you can refer back to that and see sort of the top themes of what states are working on, but I just want to touch a few notable things. Um, so at least 16 states in DC have now uh, restricted or eliminated neck restraints or other maneuvers that would result in positional asphyxia. That's one of the common themes that we've seen in states that have had uh, broader actions on their use of force standards. We've also seen um, the creation of broad statewide use of force standards. Traditionally, oftentimes statutes have been a codification of federal court rulings. And now we're seeing states really proactively put in place pretty concrete guidance in terms of use of force standards. And so a couple examples here include Colorado, which has uh, a direct codification of the standard, or Hawaii is another example. Um, the legislature didn't specify the standard itself, but they did put together a state mechanism for um, a standard to be established through agency work. Connecticut, Oregon, Virginia, and Vermont are also examples of states that have really worked on statewide use of force standards, but taking a, a number of approaches. We've also seen, um, as was mentioned earlier, an interest in oversight. So legislation in both Colorado and Virginia has empowered their attorneys general to pursue civil pattern and practice um, actions. And then additionally, we have at least seven new states that are joining the trend of empowering statewide officials, usually attorneys general, to conduct independent investigations. There's sort of a number of approaches here, including some states enacting provisions that would make investigations more independent, but haven't delegated that authority to the state level. But that is the larger overarching trend. It's to give um, state officials, usually attorneys general, the power to investigate specific incidents at the local level. Data is also really a key concern for states. They want to uh, make sure that they are making informed policies. And so this has included a couple of different approaches, things like Colorado's new law, 
which creates a new use of force database that's public. And then you can sort of see that information very transparently, very publicly. Uh, but states have also incentivized local departments to participate in otherwise voluntary data collection programs at the state level. And they've also encouraged or required agencies at the local level to participate in federal collection of data as well. So a real interest in collection of use of force data. We've seen previous legislative trends with collecting demographic and stop information, and some of those same trends are now expanding into collecting uh, more broad-based use of force data. So we can sort of gauge where states stand, but also track as reforms are implemented um, if it's having an impact as states move along that path. States are also largely responsible for the certification of officers. Almost every state has a certification system, and we've seen states uh, making new requirements for certification, including things that were pretty notable this year, like adding mental health or bias-related screenings for certification. The states have also focused on decertification, expanding grounds for when decertification um, is possible or when it's necessary or required by state law, uh, but also increasing transparency surrounding decertification. So things like Oregon and Colorado's publicly available decertification databases, um, but also states like New York that have repealed confidentiality provisions that then allow hiring agencies to communicate with one another, or states like Virginia that now require hiring agencies to communicate with one another about officer history, officer discipline, and including um, resignations uh, in lieu of discipline as well. So making sure that there's communication amongst agencies in the state. As was brought up earlier, training has also been really sort of um, central to everything that's happening. There's been retraining on new use of force standards that's been required. There's also been a focus on training for interactions with vulnerable populations. Um, and increasingly, states are also working on uh, support for their officers. In addition to those initial mental health screenings that I talked about, they're also working to provide additional and ongoing support for officers to make sure they have access to those um, mental health resources or other resources on a reoccurring basis or in particular after specific incidents have happened, including instances that involve the use of force. We have five states that have now regulated no-knock warrants, either by prohibiting them or uh, regulating when they can be used. And we also have four states that have created new state statutory analogs to federal 1983 claims. Um, those new claims vary across the four states that have created them, but all of them limit immunity in some way, um, with states like Colorado specifically naming qualified immunity as one of the pieces of immunity that um, is not an applicable defense, um, but other broader terms in the other states like Connecticut or Massachusetts. Um, states have also continued their trend of crafting alternative and non-law enforcement responses for mental health crisis situations. There's also a new focus on traffic enforcement and taking a particular look at pretext stops and um, sort of the scope of work that we ask officers to engage in as a whole. And then finally, something else that was directly tied to accountability, but is really new and notable in 2020 and 2021, is that we now have seven states that mandate the use of body cameras statewide. Prior to 2020, South Carolina was the only state to endeavor a mandate, and that was incumbent on funding. Um, so those additional six states are all brand new mandates um, in 2020 and 2021. Some of those are sort of tiered out in terms of implementation over time, uh, but it's something that's certainly notable and new in the states. Um, so I'll leave it there, but again, along with my NGA colleagues, happy to answer questions about specific state actions or some of these broader trends that we're seeing. Susan, I see. Also, I, we're going to transition next to Colorado Representative Leslie Harrod, who is on the line. And I know I mentioned Colorado's legislation um, a few times, but she's going to give us a little bit more insight into some of what Colorado has done um, and share some of her thoughts with us as well. So with that, I'm going to introduce Colorado's Representative Leslie Harrod. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes. I think, I think folks might be frozen. Can you guys hear me okay? You're great. Yep. Okay. 
Great. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome from Denver, Colorado. Excited to be here with you all um, and always uh, in partnership with uh, NCSL. Um, with the work that we are doing on policing um, and also our other partners here today as well. I'm State Representative Leslie Herod. I do represent House District 8, which is in Denver. I'm also the chair of the Black Caucus and the prime sponsor of Senate Bill 217, which was our police um, accountability bill. Um, our bill really uh, got started uh, immediately after the murder of George Floyd. Um, our community really uh, stepped up and spoke out and demanded um, real impactful um, police accountability measures throughout the state of Colorado. So while we were getting started, I will tell you we were in the middle of a COVID session. Um, we had ju actually just got started coming back from COVID um, in, in the middle of that session. Um, and it was within days that we um, had this bill introduced and we had it passed within 16 days, which was not odd or quick. Um, all of the bills during that session were about 16 to 18 days, um, but we did expand our agenda to include this work specifically because of a high profile um, murders that happened across the country, but also some of the instances that were happening right here in Colorado. So let me quickly tell you what Senate Bill 217 did, and then I'd love to talk about partnership at the federal level. Um, Senate Bill 217, you'll see a lot of these components um, are echoed in uh, what Amber mentioned uh, earlier with the, the laws that we passed. We did have a very comprehensive law enforcement accountability bill with one bill. It required body cams by all law enforcement agencies by 2023. Um, and in our requirement of having body cameras, we also have um, language specifically around um, a specified time time frame where body camera footage must be released to the families or the victims and um, as, as well as to the public with of course privacy information redacted um, at, at the request of, um, of whomever's privacy needs to be kept. Um, and so we have that in the bill. Additionally, we did give the Attorney General uh, the ability to initiate um, and carry out pattern and practice investigations. Um, that provision has already been in place and has already been utilized right here in Colorado. Um, we also require have a requirement on the reporting of use of force as well as a database around use of force. Um, and we also created a duty to intervene so that law enforcement officers um, who are on scene, um, who have the ability to intervene and stop excessive use of force from happening, um, that they have to and must intervene. They can't watch someone uh, be murdered by one of their fellow officers without intervening and without reporting. We also ban the use of chokeholds. Um, we ban the fleeing felon defense, which is shooting someone in the back while they're running away. Um, we also changed our use of force standard and we're continuing that work in Senate Bill 1250. Um, additionally, we removed post-certification for law enforcement officers who have been found to have violated uh, use of force provisions, who have unlawful use of force. Um, they will be permanently post-decertified, meaning they can no longer be a law enforcement officer in the state of Colorado again. Um, uh, and we also um, added in and clarified language around um, the the fact that law enforcement agencies cannot hire <laughs> unpost-certified or depost-certified officers. Those post-certified officers will also go into a um, national database, or I'm sorry, a statewide database that will be public. And of course, the provision that most folks are talking about, and I think very related to the conversation going on in Washington around the Justice and Policing Act, um, we did um, and qualified immunity for local law enforcement officers in Colorado through Senate Bill 217. And we're expanding that work to include state patrol um, through House Bill 1250 this year. Um, so our measure was, uh, it is comprehensive. Um, and also it is a first step. It does not include everything, uh, but it does, I think, put Colorado in the right direction to ensure that the law enforcement officers in our community who are sworn to serve and protect actually do so. And those who act outside of the scope of their badge or their authority are held accountable. Um, I will say that um, my father is a law enforcement officer retired of 30 years. Um, he worked at Supermax Prison in Southern Colorado, started as a groundskeeper um, with a hope of being able to provide for his family um, and to do something productive in society. He retired as uh, the head of internal investigations for the, for the Florence Complex, as well as um, a trainer around use of force um, and intervening and interacting with, um, with inmates. And so I'm very proud of him. 
him, very proud of his work and very proud to be able to continue that work as a legislator uh, on the other side of the conversation. Um, I will be very clear that it's important to engage stakeholders in this conversation, um, but knowing who your stakeholders are is also important. And so um, while we have very robust conversation with law enforcement, it's also really important to hear from the community, right? It's important to hear from activists. It's important to hear from those who have been harmed by law enforcement. Um, all of those groups really need to come together to create a plan to move forward. Um, it's not just law enforcement that's your stakeholders. You have to have community engagement as well. Um, and so we're doing that in Colorado and find it to be quite effective to bring um, different partners into the conversation and into the room where we're making the decisions. Um, I'm proud to say that Senate Bill 217 was not opposed by the law enforcement lobby in Colorado once we worked through the amendments. I think that was really important. Oh, and I forgot one provision that was um, very heavily negotiated around the qualified immunity and the personal responsibility for law enforcement officers who act, um, who act recklessly in our communities. Um, there is a $25,000 bad faith provision in the bill where if a law enforcement officer acts in bad faith, they are personally responsible for 20, up to $25,000 of a settlement. Um, and the settlement usually is much larger than that. Um, that was really important because the community was talking about how are we gonna hold these officers personally responsible, personally liable. There's been a lot of talk about removing pensions. Um, we don't believe that that is uh, appropriate or constitutional here in Colorado, but we did wanna say that you have to have a personal stake in the game and it should be a reasonable amount. So we negotiated that down from I think about $150,000 to $25,000. Now we are allowing for the opportunity for law enforcement officers to become personally insured. Um, I think that's a good way to go. I think the private market is really helpful in ensuring that things like um, psychological backgrounds, um, checks uh, or screenings, um, certain types of training and other programs would be effective and efficient here, especially if they're done in a way that's confidential, but helps them to um, look at, to affect their premiums. Um, we have worked with, uh, with insurance agencies here in Colorado to think about what that might look like. And right now it's looking like a, a plan would cost um, dollars uh, a month in order to, um, in order to uh, for an officer to hold, which is not, not a huge burden, but again, it does provide, I believe, um, uh, some mechanisms for also accountability in that bill. Um, and so that is kind of the overview of the bill. Again, making sure that we do engage with stakeholders. Um, I'm definitely gonna allow time for Q&A, but one thing I wanna mention is, is what, can the fed, what can the federal government do? So um, I'm in Colorado and I work very closely with Congressman Jonah Goose. Um, we actually are good friends since college and student, former student activists together. And I know he's been a part of these conversations. And really um, the big piece about it is where can the states and the, and the locals along with the federal government act together to make sure that we are truly protecting our communities um, and holding law enforcement officers accountable should they breach the trust of that community. And so we are looking for, for definitely things like funding but I also think things like withholding funding, you know, if, if, if a department is not reporting or if a department is, is not uh, properly investigating their employees or if they are not holding um, their officers to a standard that we all think um, is the appropriate standard for conduct in our communities, they should not be receiving all of these federal dollars. Additionally, um, when we have things like body cams and the requirement for body cams um, that we know tend to also exonerate officers, but most most importantly, give the community a better sense of what happened on scene. Um, we wanna make sure that there's a shared burden there. The law enforcement agencies themselves have to prioritize community trust and community safety. And so law, the local agencies should definitely be shouldering the burden for the purchasing of equipment and databases and whatnot, um, because they are a partner in these police reform efforts. But additionally, um, it would be uh, appropriate for the federal government to ensure that there are grant programs for those agencies that simply cannot shoulder the entire burden themselves, um, or states that simply need help to help out, for instance, in Colorado, some of our smaller counties um, that have done the work to try to purchase or try to re organize their budgets to purchase body cams and quite frankly, just don't have enough. Um, and so I do support those efforts as well. 
but we need a federal standard. We need a federal standard around use of force. Um, we need a federal standard around this qualified immunity piece. We need to, quite frankly, I believe, uh, remove uh, the, the federal qualified immunity provisions. Um, and we need to make sure that there are these national databases around decertif decertified officers and use of force. Use of force is extremely important so that we can track and understand where there's bias and where there's trends. The post-decertification database and every state calls it something a little bit differently is also important so that Colorado doesn't do everything that we can to make sure that other Coloradans who were bad actors are not employed in our state. But we also don't want to pull in bad actors from Wyoming, Utah, Nebraska, our neighboring cities, uh, our neighboring states, as well as other states in this country. And we want to make sure that there's a place that our agencies can go and search and make sure that they are hiring the highest quality officer. And so Again, I'm, I'm just really excited that we're having these conversations at the state level, at the federal level. I'm glad to see um, NCSL, oh, and NGA, of course, um, for jumping in and saying, let's make sense of all of these different bills and laws that are moving throughout the state and figure out what can work. That is such a huge asset to us here as lawmakers in Colorado and throughout the state. And I know they're a great resource as well for, for you all who might be out in Washington. So I look forward to questions. Um, I look forward to helping out wherever I can. And if you'd like to reach out to me, I'll be sure to put my information in the chat. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Representative Herod. And thank you for your service and to your, your father's service as well. We really appreciate uh, your time here with us. So we're going to shift gears real quick. We have two more speakers from our from our great states. And I'm going to turn it over now to Andy Wilson, Senior Advisor for Criminal Justice Policy for Governor Mike DeWine of Ohio, and Carlton Moore, the Executive Director of Ohio's Office of Criminal Justice Services. So Andy, I'll turn to you first. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, thanks for having us this afternoon. Obviously, this is an incredibly important uh, issue for, for governors throughout the, the nation. And I'd be remiss if I started talking about what we're doing in Ohio without giving everybody on this call a little bit of background uh, about my boss, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. His, uh, for those of you who don't know Governor DeWine, his, uh, his first job uh, out of law school at 25 years old was as an assistant prosecuting attorney. And in that role, he was able to work very closely with, uh, with law enforcement, local law enforcement, and work in the trenches uh, on a lot of the issues that, that law enforcement deal with, um, not just on the streets, but uh, administratively. And, and he was able to, to form relationships and kind of see what they go through uh, on the job. Now, listen, for, for me as the governor's criminal justice policy advisor, that, that, that's great because when I have to brief him, on criminal justice issues, law enforcement reform issues, whatever it is in the public safety space, I speak his, his natural language, his native language. So he understands the, the acronyms, he understands the vocabulary, he understands the, the, the processes and the, and the procedures, and there's really not too much deep diving he has to do when I'm briefing him on something because um, he, he gets it. Now, I watch other policy advisors um, from areas or subject matters that um, you know he, he doesn't have a background in. And what I see uh, when they're briefing him is, it's really almost like he's cross-examining them. He's, he's having to go two or three levels deeper, uh, really kind of drilling down so that he completely understands uh, the issues with what the, their briefing is, uh, and again, can craft his decisions and, and policy uh, accordingly. The reason I bring that up on this call is because I know many governors and many policymakers and many folks on um, on this call are kind of in the opposite position that I am in. You know, your your governor, um, the policymakers that you work with, um, really don't have a background in in law enforcement or criminal justice um, issues. So I, I just want to affirm for you the importance of um, having your your governors or or the, the the policymakers who are making these decisions do that drilling down to really get at the root of these issues. Because as you can see, again, um, from the statistics uh, and, and the information and the introductory slides and the very fact that we're on this call uh, having this conversation, this obviously is, a, is an incredibly important issue uh, that is being addressed in, in all corners of, of the nation. So every governor in the country uh, is going to have to move in this space um, and, and basically all the policymakers uh, in the country, 
are going to have to move in this space. And it's either going to be proactively getting out in front of the issues, which you're seeing a lot of governors do, or it's going to be reactive where something happens uh, in a state or in a jurisdiction and, uh, and you have to react to it and create policy uh, as a result of whatever it ha is that happened. One of the things, again, that Governor, ba Governor DeWine's background gives him or has kind of highlighted for him is the importance of whatever our policies are on this issue. They have to reflect the reality of what's going on in the streets. Uh, they have to re reflect, again, uh, practical solutions that people can use uh, in, in the trenches when they work on these issues. To that end, um, you, you really kind of figure out what that is by listening. And Carlton, uh, Carlton's going to talk a little bit about some of the, the things that he has done with respect to, to putting on listening tours across the state. But our boss uh, requires us to, to get out in the streets and, and listen to people and their concerns. Now, look, it's not enough just to, to listen to law enforcement agency executives or union uh, leaders or community activists. You got to go that next step. Um, you you got to talk to street officers and, and hear their concerns and, and to, to the best of your ability, get out there and understand what they're, they're going through. You have to, uh, again, with, with the communities, community activists, you actually need to talk to people who live in the neighborhoods. It's fascinating, you know, as we've gone through this process, you know, sometimes in, in our high crime neighborhoods where we've gone in and, and had some discussions where we thought the major complaint would be over policing and, you know, disruption of, of civil liberties, it actually was kind of the opposite. And the, the concern was, hey, look, you're not doing anything. You know, we're dying here and, you know, crime is out of control and we need the police help and we don't feel like we're getting the help from them. So the only way you find that out really is by going into the streets and, and doing that listening or getting in the trenches and doing that listening. And certainly our boss in Ohio understands that. Um, another point that the governor pushes uh, or understands, and again, Jeff hit on this at, at the very beginning, is there's, there's really no one size fit all solution. Uh, to this, you know what 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 the police do up in Cleveland uh, in Ohio certainly wouldn't work in the hills uh, or Appalachian areas of, of Southern Ohio. Um, there'll be times where you have to dictate policy, and and there'll be other times where you need to make your policy as flexible as as possible so that the locals can craft solutions that that actually work for them. So when I talk about grants here in a second, you'll see kind of how we build those uh, that flexibility in. So really the governor's experience is working in, in the trenches uh, with law enforcement on these law enforcement reform issues have allowed him to, to, to go out and talk uh, in, uh, on these topics where he can say, look, the overwhelming majority of law enforcement officers that we have in Ohio are, are good cops. They're, they're, they're hardworking, they're well-trained, they're conscientious, and they're doing the right thing. And he's not afraid to, to say that based on his experience. But also, he goes, again, from his firsthand experiences, both as a prosecutor and then he did eight years uh, as Ohio's attorney general right before he was the, the governor. He knows firsthand that there are some bad cops out there and there are people out there uh, who are in, in police departments who never should have been cops and shouldn't be cops right now. And he's not afraid to, to, to say that as, as well. And what's interesting about that is if you talk to anyone in an agency of over more than 20, a law enforcement agency of more than like 20 officers, if you ask them honestly, hey, look, do you know somebody who probably shouldn't be a law enforcement officer? They'll, they'll tell you, yeah, you know, hey, you know, Officer John, he, he's, he, he's kind of a mess. He drinks too much at home. He, he's got some issues. You know, he, he shouldn't be a cop. Now, whether or not they're policing that internally is a, a whole nother issue. But, you know, what the governor's saying uh, when he's out there talking about this issue with respect to some people just not being a, a good fit for, for law enforcement is the same thing we see in any profession. Uh, you know, there, there are people who are doctors who, who shouldn't be doctors. Uh, so really what the governor is, is talking about uh, when he's out, he, he's able to frame it not only as a law enforcement reform message, uh, but really, look, what can we do in Ohio to improve the profession of policing? And nobody can disagree with, with that. Look, we, we need to improve the profession of, of policing. And one of the things that stood out to us is, as we worked with our, our partner agencies and the subject matter experts is, look, even the cops that we talk to, when we talk about some of these changes that, that, that the governor wants to put in place, they agree. They understand that the, the gypsy cop issue is, is a great issue. The, the, 
the, the guy who is a terrible officer in Cleveland about to get fired in lieu of getting fired resigns, but then goes down to, you know, Dayton or Lima or somewhere else like that in Ohio and is able to get a job because they, they, they need, you know, boots on the ground. That's a, that's a serious problem that all law enforcement agencies in Ohio agree that, that we need to fix. So that allows, uh, again, the governor to frame it in, um, if we want our police to be professionals, uh, then we need to treat them like uh, other professions. And that's really kind of been the, the framework for, for what we're doing in Ohio. When you look at other professions, you know, typically there's a license that allows somebody to practice that profession in, in the state. Typically, there's a governing board that uh, has oversight over that license and has the ability to take discipline on people who, uh, who don't uphold the standards of that profession, including disbarment or revocation of, of that license. Typically, there's a continuing education uh, requirement for anybody in a profession. And then typically, there's a level of transparency. So uh, as the governor's uh, gone forth and, and looked at uh, different areas of how we want to, to address this issue, his initiatives really kind of fall into those areas. How can we improve oversight and accountability? How can we prove transparency? How can we prove training? And then uh, a big issue that law enforcement agencies are going to have to address is but we got to improve the way that we recruit and retain quality officers and the way we recruit and retain um, women and, and minorities into to law enforcement. So I'll very briefly talk about uh, specifically what the governor's done. Look, governors can really only act in, in three areas. They can take executive action, they can put in budget initiatives, and then they can um, put out or request that the legislative uh, body uh, take up uh, different initiatives. So that's uh, that's what the governor's done in Ohio. Uh, in the last year, uh, he's taken executive actions in ordering all our cabinet agencies. So it's our Highway Patrol, um, our Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, our hospitals, our psych hospitals, anybody who has law enforcement or corrections type supervision, they've had to go through and review their use of force policies and ban uh, chokeholds. He's ordered our highway patrol to, to go on body cameras. So the state highway patrol in Ohio, uh, we didn't have body cameras. They don't have body cameras, they have dash cameras. Inevitably, you know, somebody, they pull someone over, they jump out of the car and there, there ends up being a use of force off camera. The governor wanted to put a stop to that, make sure that we're capturing everything on camera. So he ordered the patrol to go onto body cameras. He established the Office of Law Enforcement uh, Recruiting inside of the Office of Criminal Justice Services. Uh, to really kind of provide technical support and consulting for local law enforcement agencies on recruiting. And then he also tasked uh, Carlton's office, uh, and I'm sure Carlton will talk about this. There's the, uh, the community police collaborative that we have in Ohio uh, to come up with a, a standard for law enforcement response to mass demonstrations. So that's what the executive action he took. He also, in his budget, uh, put in $10 million for body cameras. Now, we don't have a mandate that agencies go on, on body cameras. But what we wanted to do is fund it so that we could put uh, the, the rest of the agencies in Ohio that don't already have them on it. We'll take away their excuses for, for not having it. Our grants are very flexible. You know, so some, some agencies can't afford the cameras. Some agencies can't afford, uh, they could afford the cameras, but they can't afford the storage solutions. So the, the way we're gonna craft these, these grants uh, are, are flexible for the needs of the local community. And there will be a, a hook that whoever takes this money will have to adopt the, uh, the Community Police Collaborative's standard on uh, body-worn cameras. Uh, we also put out grants in the budget for um, law enforcement recruiting. So local law enforcement agencies could establish scholarships. Uh, they could uh, do a, a student loan reimbursement for uh, law enforcement certification. Uh, they could use that money to establish police athletic leagues or, um, you know, they, uh, their cadet programs in school. Again, whatever they need to, to help them get good quality officers in. Because again, across the nation, we're going to see a, an epidemic of quality officers retiring and, and getting out. And we're going to need to make sure that we're getting good folks in. And then finally, it's not in this budget, but it certainly will be in future budgets, the, the need to address officer wellness. Uh, we know that uh, officers who have other issues, alcoholism, uh, substance abuse, mental health issues, relationship, marriage issues, 
a lot of times those issues bleed into their ability to do the job as law enforcement uh, officers. And we see a lot of times issues uh, with excessive use of force or policy violations with those folks. So uh, you'll see you'll see us uh, put some money into grants for locals there as well. Finally, uh, you know, there's a, a legislative package uh, that really kind of looks like everything that was talked about in the beginning, uh, oversight board and professional uh, license, the creation of, of those, uh, establishing an officer discipline database, establishing a use of force database, and then requiring an independent investigation of, uh, in, independent investigation and prosecution of officer involved critical incidents. So again, that's a lot. Um, what you see out of Ohio is uh, uh, very reflective of what's going on uh, across the, the, the nation. And um, you know, it's part of the overall uh, criminal justice reform that, that uh, we're looking at. Again, you can't address law enforcement reform without also looking at mental health reform um, and, and how law enforcement officers uh, address mental health with, with the citizens that they're, they're encountering. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carlton and he can talk about what, uh, what he's doing in his shop. All right, thank you, Andy. So I know, I know uh, Mary Catherine, we're running, uh, we're running short on time here. So I will try to get through this as quickly as I possibly can so we can uh, give our guests time to ask questions. So I'm gonna talk about the Ohio Collaborative. That's the one Ohio thing uh, that I will talk about. Uh, but before I get into the Ohio Collaborative, I just want to mention something on, uh, on Burn JAG and the benefits that we get in Ohio from, from the Burn JAG program. Because the grant program, actually, the benefits go far beyond the dollars that we actually uh, use uh, to fund people's programs. In fact, the dollars really serve as the basis of our ability to bring people together to work on a whole host of issues around the criminal justice system in Ohio. And it is because of, of our work together on other criminal justice issues um, and those positive uh, experiences that when it comes to criminal justice reform, we're able to reach out to people we've already worked with and put us in a better position to work on things that Andy mentioned or things like the Ohio Collaborative. You know, Andy mentioned a number of things that we are doing today but the Ohio Collaborative is something that we have been working on uh, for the last few years. It's a 12-person advisory board made up of a diverse group of Ohioans, uh, including prosecutors, our state NAACP chair, the faith-based community, community leaders, legislators, law enforcement, and researchers focused on criminal justice. The board itself creates voluntary standards for law enforcement agencies to adopt. And the collaborative board was created as a result of the recommendations from the Ohio Task Force on Community Police Relations, which was formed after the deaths of Tamir Rice and John Crawford III. That task force was charged with holding four public meetings and making recommendations on how to improve the important relationship between communities and police. The collaborative was created by Governor John Kasich by executive order, and it has continued under Governor Mike DeWine. And while the, the collaborative was create, has created specific standards, it seeks generally to create transparency, to build trust, and maintain, maintain a framework that, that allows us to be both proactive and responsive to issues that impact community and police. The collaborative has created nine standards addressing things like the use of force, including deadly force, hiring and recruitment, body-worn cameras, and bias-free policing. We recently amended our use of force standard to include a ban on chokeholds consistent with the new federal certification. In fact, because of the work of the collaborative and the fact that the framework was already created, upon our first report to the federal certifying agency, we were able to certify more than 600 Ohio law enforcement agencies on the new use of force standard. At that time, that represented more than 10% of all agencies who have been certified nationally. Our newest standard, as, as Andy mentioned, is on law enforcement response to mass protests, and that was passed in December. So that's all I wanna say about the collaborative, but I do wanna make just one, just a couple points on penalties. And I know that Congress often is put in the position where they, 
they're trying to uh, get compliance with certain policies by creating penalties. Unfortunately, the current penalty structure is just not an effective means to gain compliance. So I wanna just leave you with, I have a bunch of things I wanted to say about that, but I wanna leave you with three numbers just to give you the proper context in the limited reach of penalties. The first number is 0.22%. Burn Jack contributes less than one quarter of 1% or 0.22% to state and local government's own expenditures for justice system services. The second number is 1,500. Burn JAG reaches roughly 1,500 of the nation's 18,000 local law enforcement agencies. And the final number is 18. 18 is the number of states who have implemented the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act, which passed back in 2006, which imposed a 10% penalty on burn JAG. And almost 15 years later, only 18 states are in compliance. The remainder forfeit the penalty every single year. When the cost or hurdles to compliance is too high, penalties are simply not effective. Thanks. Great, thank you. That's extremely helpful. And I think given how much we've discussed today, there's a lot of lot to talk about. And, and for folks, especially on the Hill, recognition the fact that states are really taking a lot of action in this space um, moving forward. So I know we're running a little over, but we have a few minutes, I think, for just a question or two. And if folks, we don't get to your questions, I will put emails in the chat right now for any follow-up. And I also noted we will follow up via email uh, with the presentation information um, and then a recording of this briefing. So I will just, unless I see, I don't see any questions yet in the chat. So I'm going to ping this to everybody. We've been hearing a lot in terms of policing reform uh, and, and then criminal justice reform and kind of in the policy world, folks looking at that in their silos, as opposed to looking at interconnectedness of policing reform and criminal justice reform. So uh, how important, uh, this is open to any of our panelists, um, how important is it to look at both of those as part of the holistic approach to betterment and reform across the spectrum? I'll jump in. You, you cannot look at them in silos. All right. If you talk to, to, to cops out on the street, they, they didn't become cops to, to be social workers, to be mental health counselors. And if you're not if you're not addressing issues like like mental health uh, the, or the, the, the causes of criminal behavior linked to mental health, then, then you're not going to get at the root of law enforcement reform either. You know, it, it contributes to burnout on the job. It contributes to excessive use of force. It contributes to law enforcement being uh, put into situations that um, that are that are better handled by uh, by other experts. So, uh, again, you have to look at these uh, issues in in together uh, because that's the way that they'll they'll end up being addressed. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, and I appreciate the statements that were made by the other panelists as well, and all of the progress, quite frankly, that's being made across the country. It's really encouraging to see. Um, so mental health is very important. I think the reason why we are where we at, we're at today, and I'm speaking from a Colorado perspective with our you know, increase in mass shootings, our increase in, in, in death by suicide, um, and just our increase in mental health needs just goes to show you what happens when you underfund mental health care for so long. Folks are using our prisons and our jails as mental health facilities, and it's not effective, it's not working, and it is dangerous for all of us. Um, and so when we talk about criminal justice reform, including police reform, we have to talk about mental health care and substance use treatment. And it's not just when people are in crisis. That's too late. We've got to embed it into the fabric of our, of our states and our cities. And quite frankly, we have not been doing that. And our schools, we haven't been doing it. Um, and so in Denver specifically, I took off my legislative hat, put on my I am a citizen of Denver hat, and ran a ballot measure called Caring for Denver to provide more substance use and mental health funding right here in Denver. But a portion of that money must be used for efforts within law enforcement to ensure that we are getting people the resources and the services they need, not just jail. My partner in this effort is our chief of police here, Paul Pazin. 
Um, we actually have funded now co-responders um, on every shift. Um, and that actually goes to your point, Andy, about decreasing use of force, because not only are co-responders great on scene, they're also great in talking to our law enforcement officers about what's going on in their own lives in a safe and comfortable way. Love it. Like, I am super supportive of that and have expanded that with my own efforts right here in Denver. But additionally, we created the STAR model, Support Team Assistant re Assisted Response, meaning we have a van now, similar to Cahoots, as you know, in Oregon, that is in Denver, um, in the central core area, that has a mental health professional and an EMT respond on crisis calls as dispatched by 911. Since STAR has been in existence, we have had zero negative interactions with law enforcement resulting in um, resulting in jail or ticketing. And since we have expanded co-responders, our co-responders have a 2% ticketing rate, 2%. That's great. We are doing great in this. And I'm so proud to say that the mayor of Denver has now picked up our efforts from Caring for Denver and moved it from a pilot to a complete program with about $2 million in funding that will reach the entire city. Again, we have more work to do, but if we think of these issues only in silos as law enforcement accountability and reform or mental health reform here or criminal justice for reform here, we're not gonna be doing our jobs. We're gonna miss the boat and we actually won't see the outcomes that I think we all want, which is more folks surviving interactions with law enforcement in the communities, more law enforcement coming back into law enforcement, good officers doing good things, and community being able to say, look, son, I want you to grow up and be like this fine officer and help out our community the way this community is being helped. And so we can do that together. We can reimagine policing. And that's what we're trying to do right here in Colorado. Great. And kind of to pull that thread, we have a question in the chat of, um, have you all adopted mental health checkups for officers as well? We have not, and I, and I think we should. I love this idea. Um, we have not, and we have not figured out a way to do that um, at the state level, but I am working with my local law enforcement officer, uh, Chief of Police, Paul Pazin, to think this through, but um, I'll let other folks answer too. Oh, sure. So actually we're working on a, we're working on a standard right now. Actually, I, I just uh, finalized the, our latest draft of the standard earlier today on officer wellness. And so, you know, this is an incredibly important standard. We had a meeting, our last collaborative meeting, we had an officer come in. He's a sergeant with Cincinnati, uh, the Cincinnati Police Department. He talked about trauma that he had dealt with more than 20 years ago. And then, you know, fast forward 20 years, he is the commanding officer on something uh, on a, a vehicular pursuit that had a pretty tragic outcome. And this hit him again. And the impact it had on him to do his job and to do it effectively. And I actually asked him during, during our meeting, how did it impact your ability to work and deal with the public? And he said it devastated it. He saw everyone as a threat. Um, and so this is another thing, you know, I think Andy and, and uh, Leslie brought up the fact that you have to look at these things together and you do because our officers, what they go through and how it impacts them is going to impact the way they deal with people in our communities. And so we've got to focus on all these issues together. Absolutely. I'm going to jump in and provide some recent examples there too. Connecticut House Bill 6004 from their last session is maybe the most recent example, and they require initial behavioral health screening and certification, and then following that either every five years or for good cause. Um, and then California is the state example for the bias screening specifically as well. They require an evaluation for physical, emotional, or mental conditions in addition to that bias-based screening. And that's California Assembly Bill 846. So those are just two examples that are very recent that might be beneficial. Great. Thank you, Amber. And I think we're over time and I want to be conscious of everyone's time. So for our three presenters, if knowing our audience and knowing about the federal action, if there's one big takeaway you'd like to leave with. So Representative Harriet, I'll start with you and then we'll go Andy and Carlton. 
I just want to say that, um, again, thank you for having us. Uh, I think this is an important conversation. More than happy to continue this work. Um, we have got to make sure that any of our law enforcement efforts around accountability really do have teeth. Um, accountability is an important factor. Um, we need to meet this moment right now that we are in um, where we have community willing and ready to support those electeds and those initiatives that really will make our community safer and ensure that we have the highest quality law enforcement officers on our streets. And I think that all of these efforts together are so very important. Very encouraged to hear about the work coming out of the governor's office. I would like to challenge my governor to meet to meet the moment with you all um, and do some of that work as well. And I just think the continued conversations are going to be what gets us to a place where um, we are doing the job that we want to do and we can really see that change um, in our streets. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, anything from you? Sure, my takeaway would be, look, these are tough issues. Uh, these are issues that uh, for years have been bubbling to the surface in, in the way we do policing. Uh, but, but the time is now uh, to, to, to take action. And although it's, going, it, it's not gonna be fixed overnight, it's something that takes a, a long time. It's a slow process because change is always uh, a slow process. Um, it, we, we have to do something now. And we're going to come out the back end of this with uh, with uh, more professional, um, better trained uh, law enforcement officers who uh, aren't just better officers, happier officers, but uh, who are or better accepted by the community. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I you know I'd echo um, the two previous comments, but I would just say you know this is important. This is really really important. Um, this is, uh, we're at a moment that we cannot, we cannot let this moment pass without doing something about this. And so I would urge people, no matter how you come at this, uh, no matter what you, whether you think everything is fine or everything's okay, or everything is terrible, you know, we need your energy and your ideas and your effort. And we need people to come to the table, uh, because, there are so many people counting on states and partners and police and communities and, and federal government to get this done and to get this done right. And I, we cannot continue to go on the way things are right now. You know, something has to change. So I would urge everyone to come to the table and listen, listen for a change to what people have to say. And if we all listen, and we all respect other people's positions, um, we can get something done and it can be very trans transformational. Great. Well, I will not build on that because that was a wonderful conclusion uh, and a very salient point. So again, I really want to thank all of our presenters and my colleagues at NCSL and NCJA and all of you who participated today. 